Whenever someone mentions Mexico, we probably think of tacos, tequila, and mariachi bands. But unfortunately, it's also very likely that a moment later, we'll also think of violence, drug trafficking, and organized crime. In fact, 2023 has kicked off with a piece of news that has made headlines around the world. Sinaloa cartel launches violent response as Mexico recaptures El Chapo's son. Logically, the arrest of a narco is good news, but the immediate consequences may not be so positive. When a big fish goes down, it suddenly unleashes huge waves of violence to which many Mexicans have sadly become accustomed. The reality, visual politic viewers, is that violence is so deeply rooted in Mexican society that it has even become part of popular culture. There is a strong tradition of Mexican corridos, songs and ballads about politics, romance and history. And I'm sure you've also heard of their more controversial variant, the Narcoridos, songs that tell the stories of narcos who are portrayed even heroically. And let's be honest, although Mexico is much more than all that, it unfortunately makes perfect sense that we associate this country with the world of drug trafficking. After all, it is the natural land bridge to the giant and coveted US market. For the narcos, being so close to the world's largest narcotics consumption center is a no-brainer. But wait a minute, this alone doesn't explain why there is so much violence in Mexico. After all, if it were about the border, the narcos would have set up shop in Canada too, right? Well, let's take a look at this map. What you are seeing on screen is a map dividing the city of El Paso, Texas, and Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. This area has always been considered one of the hottest spots in the American drug trade. But what if I told you that El Paso is considered one of the safest major cities in the United States, while Ciudad Juarez is considered one of the most violent cities in Mexico? In fact, in 2021, Ciudad Juarez was rated the Mexican city with the second highest number of homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. So the problem cannot only be drug trafficking, can it? Well, that's the way it goes. For many, the real problem in this country is not about the drug traffic per se, but above all, the weakness and corruption of many of the Mexican institutions themselves. There are even experts who point out that a large part of Mexico is basically something like a failed state, where many citizens trust the narcos more than the state itself. Or maybe the problem is that in those areas, the state has practically no role and all the control is in the hands of those same narcos. So much for confronting them. Perhaps that is why, ever since the Mexican government began to confront drug trafficking directly in 2000, violence has skyrocketed, and today, it is by far the country's biggest problem. The biggest problem, and also one of the top priorities of the current president, Andres Manuel López Obrador. The question, therefore, is, why is there still so much violence in Mexico? To what extent do the Mexican cartels have power? What successes is AMLO really achieving? Today in this video, we're going to answer all of these questions. But first, as always, let's look at some history. Intimate enemies. In general, the relationship between drug traffickers and governments has been quite murky and stormy. You never know what you're going to find. For example, since the United States declared war on drugs in 1971 under President Richard Nixon, dozens and dozens of governments around the world have multiplied their efforts to try and crack down on drug traffickers. However, the harsh reality is that all of these efforts have been to little avail. Drug traffickers continue to place their merchandise right, left and center throughout Europe and the United States. Which explains, for example, why street prices have remained reasonably stable over the last few years. We are talking about an entire gigantic billion dollar industry whose power networks reach the level of those who are supposed to confront them. The situation is such that it is even believed that the CIA, the FBI and the DEA itself have allowed narcotics to enter the United States in order to catch the big fish. However, if there is one country where the collaboration between the state politicians and drug traffickers has become better known over time, it is precisely who we're talking about today, Mexico. Without digging too deep, one of the parties with the most scandals and accusations of its ties to the drug trafficking is none other than Mexico's Institutional Revolutionary Party, better known as the PRI. Quite simply, we are talking about a party that has controlled the government of Mexico for more than 60 years. And that is a long time. Long enough to make friends in hell itself. In fact, the PRI's history has been characterized by anything. It is being plagued by all kinds of accusations of electoral fraud and above all, corruption. But not just any corruption, but corruption linked to drug trafficking and organized crime. Do you want an example? Well, there are cases like Raul Salinas de Gotari, one of the brothers of the former president Salinas de Gotari, who was seriously involved in corrupt dealings with the Gulf Cartel in the 1980s. He was arrested in 1995. Yet during the six decades of PRI governments, narco violence never became so serious a problem as it is today. So the question is, what has changed? Well, let's see. During the time the PRI was in power, a kind of unwritten pact was established whereby the narcos enjoyed a certain freedom of action as long as they did not sow chaos in the country. That is, if they more or less behaved well, 
They could do whatever they wanted. In fact, the PRI saw a golden opportunity to perpetuate itself in power thanks to its permissiveness with drug traffickers and organized crime, which guaranteed a certain amount of social peace. However, its northern neighbor, the United States, was not exactly pleased with this role. For the gringos, the fight against drugs was a crucial issue and had been so even before Richard, I am not a crook, Nixon, officially declared the war on drugs. <laughs> For example, the first campaign to exterminate opioid crops in Mexico took place as early as 1948. And that was not the end of it. From 1948 on, the PRI had to juggle between the interests of the United States and those of the PRI. And those interests often pointed in opposite directions. So although the PRI governments carried out such well-known operations as the Condor of the 1970s to hunt down the drug traffickers and dismantle crops in the Sinaloa highlands, they did not really do much damage. Let's just say that these operations functioned rather as a way of appeasing the United States and convincing them that Mexico had really, honestly, got its act together. In the meantime, Mexico's own political hierarchs enjoyed all their power. That's as long as they did not bother the local mafias and cartels. Everybody won and nobody complained. Things, more or less, worked. So what was the problem? Well, sooner or later, the narcos became so filthy rich that they began to have more and more influence over a large part of the Mexican citizenry. And of course, it was just that that moment when it was realized that the narcos could become a real competition for the political and military power of the state itself when it was decided to start fighting them once and for all. So what's the problem now? Well, perhaps in the case of Mexico, that moment came just a little too late. Check this out. All Out War New century, new government. Mexicans must have thought. As soon as the year 2000 began, a new president took power, Vincente Fox. From the PRI? No. For the first time in six decades, the PRI had lost power. The PAN, the National Action Party, took the reins after the first peaceful transfer of government in Mexico since the revolution at the beginning of the 20th century. A new era began, and with it, a new policy against the narcos. The new president, Vicente Fox, aligned himself with US interests and launched an enormous offensive against organized crime. And not exactly like those of the PRI, which were more about appearances than real effect. No, this time it was for real. The armed forces began to play a more prominent role in the fight against drugs. In fact, the Fox administration passed a new national security law that gave the armed forces more capacity to act in civilian affairs in peacetime. And from then on, it went straight after the cartel bosses. So during his presidency, it was not unusual to see news items like this one. Mexico strikes blow to drug trafficking with capture of Tijuana cartel boss. So all good, right? Don't you think? Well, the reality is that his strategy of using the armed forces and escalating the fight against the drug traffickers bore sweet fruits. Yes, but also some very bitter ones. Drug trafficking to the US did not slow down, but rather continued to grow. Cartels fragmented and suddenly violence rates skyrocketed. In the end, during Fox's presidency, the number of new cartels and organized criminal groups multiplied. Let's just say that one drug lord would fall and two new ones would pop up. And take note, because if you think the situation could not get any worse, you are very wrong. After Fox came Felipe Calderon and the fight intensified. In fact, Calderon is the president who formally proclaimed the war on drugs in Mexico. He did it hand in hand with the United States thanks to the Merida Initiative. So what did their strategy consist of? Well, basically to fight head on against the narcos. And when I say head on, I mean fighting with all possible resources as if it were a real war. Violence skyrocketed even more. And what is even worse, the state couldn't win the war. In 2012, it suddenly seemed that everything was going to stop with a stroke of a pen. Why? Because that year, the PRI returned to power with Enrique Peña Nieto. And the truth is that things changed, but for the worst. Look at this graph. The new PRI government registered the bloodiest figures in Mexican history. With Vicente Fox, the number of annual homicides remained stable. With Calderon, they began to rise like crazy. But with Pena Nieto, well, let's just say they broke all records in 2018. There didn't seem to be any remedy in sight. And then in 2018, a figure appeared who promised to completely change the security strategy. Check this out. Hugs, not bullets. At this point in the movie, a populist leader becoming the president of a Latin American country is not anything new. This is the perfect land for populist crops. Hugo Chavez, Cristina Kirchner, Rafael Carrera, Evo Morales, Gustavo Petro, on and on and on. I'm sure these are names that do not take anyone by surprise, but guess what? Mexico is no exception, and in 2018, our already well-known Andres Manuel López Obrador, AMLO, came to the Mexican presidency. The son of merchants and a descendant of Spanish and indigenous people, AMLO paradoxically began his political career with the PRI. However, after the fraudulent elections of 1988, he switched 
switched to the party of the Democratic Revolution, with which he became chief of government of the federal district between 2000 and 2005. From then on, little by little, his popularity grew until finally, in 2018, on the third attempt, he won the presidential election. And keep in mind that AMLO has traditionally stood out not only for his messages, his populist style, or even his eccentricities, but also for the discourse he has been defending for decades against the militaristic strategy used by the various Mexican governments in their fight against drug trafficking. In fact, the name of their strategy is tremendously catchy. Check this out. Que yo hable de abrazos y no eh, balazos. Yo digo que voy a seguir sosteniendo lo mismo. Ustedes creen que solo deteniendo a capos se va a resolver el problema? No. Claro que si los encontramos los detenemos. Pero el propósito es atender las causas. Hugs, not bullets. Sounds nice, right? However, the reality, visual politic viewers, is that the success of the slogan has not been translated into practice by any matter of means. Take a look at this. Homicides decrease, but AMLO's six-year term is shaping up to be the most violent one. Since AMLO took power, he has not been able to reduce crime rates much. In fact, in the first two years of his presidency, 2019 and 2020, almost the same number of homicides were reported as in Peña Nieto's fateful last year. In fact, in the end, his promise to demilitarize citizen security and return the army to the barracks fell on deaf ears. In fact, AMLO has changed his mind so much that his star project, the National Guard, has ceased to be an institution with civilian command to be directed by Sedena, the Secretariat of National National defense. In other words, he has militarized the National Guard that he himself created in 2019 precisely to get the army off the streets. And not only that, he is now even delegating civilians' tasks to the armed forces. Let's see, it is true that the art of saying one thing and doing something else completely is nothing new in Mexico, but it's also striking coming from AMLO, a leader who puts so much emphasis throughout his political career on the demilitarization of public security. Now, however, it is quite the opposite. He is even putting the armed forces through the roof. SEMAR is the agency most prepared to defend sovereignty and confront the threats of smuggling and drug smuggling, AMLO 2021. The problem is that with so much praise, the president forgets the corruption. Without going any further, in October 2022, the so-called Guacamaya came to light, exposing tens of thousands of emails, conversations, and official Sedena files. Files and conversations of all kinds of issues, from AMLO's own health to the business of the armed forces, which is now also in charge of infrastructure construction. Therefore, it's not so unusual that we come across news stories like this one. Military officers accused of financial irregularities in construction of Banco del Bienestar branches. Nor can we forget that, throughout the history of Mexico, the Mexican armed forces have been involved in serious accusations of human rights violations. In a way, this is typically what happens when you mix guns power and corruption. The question now is, is it paying off for AMLO to do exactly the opposite of what he promised on security? Or to put it another way, is AMLO's new strategy working for him? Well, let's find out. The Narco Tanks Tanks and armored vehicles have now become fashionable, if only because Ukraine is expected to receive dozens and dozens of tanks this year. But even before military armored vehicles became fashionable, the narcos had already had their eye on this possibility, using armored vehicles to consolidate their territorial power in Mexico. Now, it's true that they're not armored vehicles manufactured by the sophisticated military industrial complex, but something a little bit more commonplace. But they are still dangerous. I'm talking about the so called narco tanks. Weirdos like this one. And of course, at this point, you are probably wondering, but Grant, if even the narcos already have their own homemade tanks, is it really possible that AMLO can improve the country's security? Well, in theory, the figures say yes, not much, but something is better than nothing. Since the arrival of Lopez Obrador, crime has remained very active as it was under his predecessors. However, it is also true that in 2021, he did manage to bring homicides down by 4.3% from the previous year. Even better, in 2021, there were on average some 26.6 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants, or nine more homicides per 100,000 inhabitants than in 2015. On the other hand, serious crime and kidnapping cases have continued to maintain their downward trend since they started in 2019. And now, don't get me wrong, the truth is that this data continues to be bleak and the militarization strategy continues to be a bottomless pit that is not achieving the expected results. 
Perhaps defeating the narcos will require other methods, and it's here that we have to take into account that the very functioning of the cartels makes it very difficult to take them down. Don't forget that they use increasingly advanced combat methods and weapons, drones, narco tanks, even weaponry used by the US infantry itself, such as the Browning M2 50 caliber machine gun. And if we add to this fact that the Mexican institutions and services do not cover the whole country, it stands to reason that the cartels will not disappear. What's more, do you remember when at the beginning of this video we told you about the arrest of Ovidio Guzman, Chapo Guzman's son? Well, Ovidio has been the capo of the Señola cartel since Mexico extradited his father to the United States in 2017. And the question is, do you think that even if Ovidio Guzman has been arrested, the Señola cartel is going to stop trafficking drugs, extorting whoever they want, or trafficking people? Exactly. You guessed it. Of course not. And this is one of the key points of drug trafficking and organized crime in Mexico. They are no longer pyramidal organizations. Now they have a decentralized organization with hubs that work independently. In other words, if the leader falls, the whole team does not fall. But in practice, everything continues more or less as if absolutely nothing had happened. So everything indicates that AMLO's strategy is going to be another failure in the already long struggle against the Mexican narco state. And keep in mind, we are talking about failure not because he has not achieved any improvement, we have already seen that that's not the case. In any event, the cartels are very well armoured and the Mexican state does not have a strategy capable of confronting them to decimate them once and for all. AMLO's idea of hugs not bullets is not bearing fruit and Mexico continues to be one of the most dangerous countries in the world, where the narcos do not give hugs but bombings and kidnappings. This is the terrible reality in Mexico. But now, the question is over to you. Do you think AMLO will be able to turn the situation around before he leaves office. What alternative to militarization do you think we can find? Is the war on drugs really worth it? You can leave us your answer below in the comments. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Politic we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it so we know. All the best and I'll see you next time.